Welcome, <clears throat> welcome, 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 welcome to Conversations. A great honor, a great honor and a personal uh, privilege for me to be talking with a dear friend of mine from way back, a very important citizen of Spaceship Earth, uh, that being Norman Kurland. He, we're doing this by Skype. He's down in, um, in the Washington area. And we're going to be doing two full hours with Norman about uh, economic questions that are very important that he's contributing mightily to. And so perhaps if we could then by Skype, we could connect. And Norman, it's so good to uh, be in touch with you over the, over the Skype system from man man in Manhattan. So good to talk to you, Norman. There you are. Harold, it's a pleasure to be with you. I love your shirt, brother. Who does <laughs> your shirts? You know, that really looks good. Owned or be owned. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, Norman, we got two full hours, okay? And we're dear friends from way back and everything. I think maybe we could go back and talk about how you and I first came to know one another. And also, we're going to want to talk about this fellow, Louis Kelso, and all of that. But we go way back to, if I remember it right, uh, I want you to share some of your background, particularly your work with Ennis Francis and work in civil rights and all of that in a biographical sense. And maybe that's what I'd ask you to set off with. Why don't you introduce yourself to the audience uh, first, and then we can get into when you and I met way the heck back. I think it was in 1972. But Share your own background, Norman, if you would. You got a JD or attorney, but share your background, please. Well, you know, I try to keep it as concise as possible, Harold. Yeah. But uh, you know, I come out of uh, uh, Connecticut. I uh, get my undergraduate at UConn, and then went into the service for five years. I was a, an officer for five years. Had a couple commands mm. during the Korean War. Uh huh. Uh, and uh, then uh, came out not being sure what the heck I wanted to do, yeah, and uh, went to law school where at the University of Chicago, right, uh, where I studied law and economics. Oh, right. And we'll talk a little bit about about the failure of academia in general. To talk in general, I'd be happy to talk about that if you don't. Know, Milton Friedman territory, right? Well, yeah, Milton Friedman was there, mm -hmm. and the law and economics program in the United States got started there uh -huh. uh, by Milton Friedman's brother-in-law, Aaron Director. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, first I resisted uh, uh, the, uh, the teachings of the uh, monetary school right. of economics, the Chicago school. But the more I thought about it, the more I became convinced it did have uh, a considerable merit simply because uh, it was taught in a program. Uh, it was law and economics, and the law part was the dean of the law school who became attorney general, uh -huh. Ed, Ed Levy. Uh -huh. And there it, I became convinced in the studying of antitrust law yeah. that uh, I hated monopolies. Yeah. And, and the alternative to monopoly or concentrated economic power or concentrated production and control over the production system uh, uh, was wrong. Uh, it deprived people, and I didn't have a better answer, but I did recognize that the market system had some value in it, uh, and then... Uh, but let me, but you always had, Norman, if I'm not mistaken, I'm, I'm hearkening back to a, a couple of names like Ennis Francis and so forth, you have an ingrained sense of impo uh, the importance of justice, which was... Uh, 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 informing your consciousness at that time as well. You're well, very it, much it, based on. Interesting thing. Uh, yeah. I, I think that's almost it's almost uh, within your nature to to uh, to uh, reflect justice. I, I couldn't define it even after I got out of law school uh -huh. until I came across Kelso. So there was a period of time after law school I came to Washington wanting to change the world yes. out a way in which the United States could avoid wars like the Korean War. Uh -huh. uh, I resigned my commission when we went into the Vietnam War. Yeah, was, right. It was all stupid to have done that. And you were involved in, a, in an empathetic and active way with uh, the civil rights issues that are emerging also, right? 
Yeah, and it's Francis and so forth. Yeah. Right, but it's one step at a time. Now. Okay, okay, yeah. And it's Francis until many years later. Okay. Into the uh, mid, uh, really the, the latter half of the 1960s. Mm -hmm. So uh, well, that's I got getting... out of law school in, in, uh, in 1960. The latter half of the 1960s, there was a whole lot of shaking going on on the civil exactly. rights issue, right? And you were involved in the side of justice on that issue, were you not? Very much. Seriously, but, yeah, good uh, for you. You know, you may be interested in how I came across Kelso. Well, I would be, and I'll share how I did as well, but that's down the line now, my brother. Do introduce uh, uh, Kelso, right. Okay, but it, it, you see, the, you, uh, people will not understand the evolution that I had to go through. Right. It would be so good. To, I, I, it I, might I, be good I to... Left it might be good for people to understand that because it applied to it is to change that, that a lot of the people viewing might be considering going through at the moment here in 2014 i would suggest perhaps uh, but uh, how i was on the wrong track okay 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 well i think a lot of the world's on the wrong track now don't you including a lot of our political leadership i would submit they're, but, on, hmm. they're on the track i was on until 1965 when i okay. first heard Kelso. that's so early that was after my work in mississippi it was yeah. after my work uh, in the department of health education and welfare uh, uh in which i was looking for an answer to the poverty program, mm -hmm. and the best I could come up with was the negative. It was a guaranteed annual income right. being talked about, mm -hmm. and then Milton Friedman had mm -hmm. what he called the negative income tax. And yeah. I thought, well, you know, I have nothing better. Uh -huh. I'll just redistribute through government. Uh -huh. I, I, the, the thing that I found out in government is that uh, the people at the top really, in general, have no feel for the poor. Uh -huh. That's a very problem. And yeah. They don't mind handing, handing things out, but they really do not empower all the citizens. It's Nor not, are they interested in doing that particularly. Okay. So, so yeah. what happened after after uh, the the uh, uh, my work at health, education, and welfare? I went to the Commission on Civil Rights. Okay. And the Commission on Civil Rights uh, was in the General Counsel's office, and we had a program to go down to Mississippi. Uh huh. And 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 uh, uh, write a report on what was going on in Mississippi. This is 1962. 62 is really early, brother. Well, in my way was, of thinking. You know, a lot went on before that. Yeah. In any event, I was there uh, doing work from 62 to 64, became very close to Medgar Evers uh -huh. uh, before he died, yeah. and to the uh, people, the young people, in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. You knew you knew Snow, Stokely, right? Stokely, Stokely was Carmen? one of those, but Bob Moses was okay. Was the key person, right? In the uh, in SNCC, but yeah. you have a lot of people, and what I saw there, mm -hmm. what I saw there, were a bunch of people who did what everyone thought was impossible, mm. and that is they challenged the power structure of Mississippi and the Deep South. Right. And, and the senators from the Deep South really oh. had control over the laws. Sure. Nobody thought that it'd be possible to overcome it, except for these young people. Right, right, so right. You, you didn't have the country behind it. No. You had these young people going out there in, in Greenwood, Mississippi, I remember. Well. Uh, they... Uh, well, confronted the White Citizens Council yeah. right in the heartland, in the in the capital of uh, of what was the equivalent of the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah, and these right. young people went there. Yeah, and and they challenged the the exclusion from voting. Right, and and uh, there was a and uh, by '63, as you might recall, uh, before Kennedy was assassinated, yeah, uh, uh, Medgar Evers was killed yeah someone and i and uh, and i worked in, i gave a, a paper before snick uh they had a conference here in washington it was called an anatomy of a of a an assassination right uh, anatomy mm -hmm. of a martyrdom is okay 
Right. And, and the important thing there yeah. is it showed what the state of mind was of the people who had power in Mississippi. Yeah, it was. How uh, that led in the media, uh -huh. how that led up to some kook uh, taking a rifle and killing Medgar on his way home. Yeah. Uh, 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 as, and, and as a result of that, uh, uh, I saw uh, that uh, SNCC was in there yeah. organizing. Now, yeah. the, the thing that occurred, SNCC in 1964 had what was called the Mississippi Freedom Summer. Yeah, right. And, and they, they had Freedom the Riders. Of Ohio. Yeah, you had Freedom Riders coming down from the and Northland, said, too, then starting. That was before. In yeah. the, uh, that oh. was in the late, late. Oh, that was uh, late 50s, uh, early 60s. In the late 50s, you had Freedom Riders from up uh, north yeah, coming had, down had, seriously? I think that's pretty early for that. It, it, was, it was before I got there, the Freedom Riders had, they never got to Mississippi. They, they were stopped before they, they yeah, got there. But they were really taking a stand, and that was, a, it was, it was like Bobby Dillon was singing something blowing in the wind, and the civil rights... <laughs> was a major defining issue that was being addressed finally, right? Yes, but mm. what, what really made the difference mm. was when SNCC called for a, uh, a, a 19, the 1964 uh, Mississippi Freedom Summer. All right, yeah. And what they yeah. did was reach out to students from all over the country. Right. Come into Mississippi. First to go to Miami of Ohio. I gave some lectures there on how you can manipulate the federal government yeah. and federal programs. And there were, uh, 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 Baird Rustin was there. And Baird so, Rustin, yeah. And, yeah. and while we were there, mm -hmm. uh, there was the report of the three kids who were yeah, Swarney and Cheney, or exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah. So, so uh, uh, but but the point is that Mississippi Freedom Summer mm. brought the attention of the world with people going into Mississippi, mm -hmm. the heartland uh, of, of racism. Yeah, right. And, and as a result, by uh, the impossible became uh, uh, achieved. Well, and I think that's a metaphor for what you're about now in this year, 2014. It seems unachievable that we can ever have a really economic justice system that serves everybody and the ecology in a way that we never have. It's impossible because it never have had it. And so I just make that point that you're up Still yeah, climbing they're, they're up that right. Mount Sisyphus, yeah. You're, you're right, it's, but what uh, in, 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 I left the Civil Rights Commission to, to join the War on Poverty. Thank you. Community Action Program in 65. Mm -hmm. I had been I had been writing speeches for the Commissioner of Education because the people at, in the Civil Rights Commission were kind of uh, uh, wary of my participation, <laughs> my relationships with SNCC. Right, right, uh, right, and, right. And right. so, so uh, they they assigned me to the Department of Education. <laughs> yeah, right. And I was writing speeches uh, uh, on racism uh -huh. for for uh, Commissioner Keppel. Yeah. I remember him. Oh. And then what happened is that was the same time Kennedy got was assassinated, yeah. and it made it possible for Johnson to come and get behind something that Kennedy would not have been able to get behind. You think that that's true? He, is that because Johnson had said overwhelming uh, power, or I mean, he he had a persuasiveness that was incredible, oh, he but had, and he uh, had some touch with that Southern sentiment and so forth. So the Voting Rights Act and the Civil well, Rights Bill. The vote, so Voting Rights Act in '64. Yeah. You had, and in '64 you had the War on Poverty, and in that. But you don't think Kennedy could have done that? You no, think it took think Johnson so. to get no, that I don't done? Think so. I oh, don't think so. Well, that's a. I think Johnson uh, took advantage of the of the of the confusion and anger and concern and was able to get it through. Ramsey but, Clark was the Attorney General at that time. Ramsey Clark has been a, a stalwart fellow in terms of justice. And well, so forth. Uh, he was the attorney general at the Voting Rights Act, yeah. You know, the people, uh, people in the Kennedy administration reacted positively. There were some who were more aggressive than others. 
But in any event, yeah. uh, the report that we had done for Mississippi is suppressed. I have a copy of it in my app. Keep that copy. Get it under that's lock and key. This is part of it history. will live. It'll have legs of its that, own. That, yeah. That's right. But mm. this is a reflection of the, of the concern of those uh, who are not real leaders yeah. uh, uh, about re, uh, working together with people who, who are true revolutionaries, yeah. good revolutionaries. Do you think of yourself as a revolutionary? Absolutely. That's you the, do think of yourself as a revolutionary. Uh, that's the ultimate profession. Are you <laughs> the, ultimate, <laughs> the ultimate profession? But it's revolutionary of ideas. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, this is all before uh -huh. I, it came across Kelso. Yeah, right. Now, let me, let, me, let me just mention one thing. Uh -huh. this, the Civil Rights Movement died after the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And yeah. it was effect. We still have racism it's rampant. Because going. their yeah. economic agenda uh -huh. yeah. was, was out of date. It was defective. Uh, uh, you had demonstrations asking for jobs yeah. and welfare. Yeah. They not ownership. Yeah, right. Jobs and welfare. It looks like as he I said, as I said to uh, you, uh, I was also trying in to that pair. The, well, so, trying to solve the problems. Not uh, it, it was through uh, redistribution through through taxation. Right. Okay. Let's go over that a little bit. Did you do? You did law and so forth, but you were also. I think I heard you had some concern for economics, and it seems to me economics and the political process are joined at the hips. Are they at the hip? Are absolutely, they not? Absolutely. And ha had you picked up? Yeah. Oh, let, let, Norman, had you picked up an economic theory before you get it? Like, uh, did you study Keynes? Did you study Schumpeter so, and yeah, these I, kind of I things? I studied Keynes as, in, in my undergraduate work. And that was sort of the that, accepted that, paradigm. Just, but in there, it was it was the wrong paradigm, but, but I just... But it was accepted, it, it was accepted it, knowledge then it that the that's... Best. It was, uh, Harold, I didn't know economics, so I, I studied Keynesian economics, and that's what was taught. Yeah. And and it, it wasn't until Kelso that I could see the, okay. the real flaws. Did you ever have a flirtation, as so many of people concerned with justice, with the Marxian analysis of things? Uh, and, uh, as a matter of fact, it, was, it wasn't until, really, uh, the Marxist analysis just didn't really appeal to me because all I could see was the Soviet Union yeah. owning and controlling, everybody having to work for them. And it was clear to me that was not an answer. I think it's a good thing for us to get that down solid because we're talking about a man, uh, uh, um, uh, Louis Kelso. We're going to be talking about him. And he wrote a major book that's got a very controversial title. I, you say you don't like the title. I like the title, but as it happens, well, that's no it big was issue. this book here. Right? Yeah, hold it at the Capitalist Manifesto. Now, that book was written, in, and in it's the, so the, well the, written, and it was mostly Lewis that wrote that. It had a co-author in no, no, Mortimer no, Adler. Let me say something. Okay, go it's, and say it. That the, the basic concept of, uh, of universal access to ownership was uh, Kelso. Yeah. He called it the theory of capitalism. Now, uh, Mortimer Adler wrote chapter he, five of this let's book. In, it, let me pause a minute. Let's say Mortimer Adler is in the mind of many people as the preeminent American philosopher. Well, Mortimer was, Adler is a major intellectual force. Absolutely. And he, so to have his imprimatur on that was important. But the book was written in 1958. Yes. Way yes. back when the big issue of the time was the Cold War between capitalism and communism, and yeah. communism was centered in the Soviet Union. And that was a major issue that influenced all politics and geopolitical it's, thinking and economic thinking, no? Exactly. Right, it, okay. You, if people were, were looking at communism uh, as strictly in terms of what the Soviet Union was, but this went into the theory. As a matter of fact, before this book was written, mm -hmm. incidentally, you can get this book Download it free from our website yeah. at www.cesj.org, uh -huh. as well as the second book that he and Adler uh, wrote, uh -huh. which, which the is new very, capital. very important mm -hmm. in terms of how money is created. What is money? Uh -huh. And how money can be used to democratize mm -hmm. power, economic power, yeah. without mm -hmm. taking anything 
from from the rich. Uh -huh. You don't need them. Mm -hmm. This is the, the beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. This book was called, there was a subtitle, it was called The Proposal to Free Economic Growth from the Slavery of, of savings. savings. Of Savings, exactly <laughs> right. The point to be made, yeah. Yeah. Very important second book. And that too is downloadable from our from our website. Which but, is incidentally CESJ.org, right? That, that's it. Let's bring that up from time to time so more people can be in touch with the work you're doing down there, which is really uh, important. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Harold, Hope uh, you don't mind me mentioning your website once or twice. Okay. Or maybe three or four times. Okay, fine. Okay, good. There are many writings there. It's a library. On the on the, what we call the just third way, I don't call it capitalism. I think the word capitalism reflects a cap. If we define it the way Kelso and Adler did, mm -hmm. as things, technology, uh, natural resources, we don't want to glorify mm. things. Uh -huh. Glorify human beings should mm. be the master of things. Mm -hmm and things being the master of human beings. The, the word capitalism was not a good term. And as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. invented the term capitalism. It wasn't Adam Smith, mm -hmm. but it was Karl Marx. Karl Marx, okay, yeah. So, so it, 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 he doesn't use, they use language very well. And yeah. he certainly wasn't trying to create a, a word I that expressed anything other than Injustice. Yeah, right. Well, he may have been more prescient than he thought and everything like that. You know, but I wonder if we could back up to the premise of the Capitalist Manifesto or the philosophy. It's come and some people say that there's a term binary is that um, it's the idea of saving from it, the history of the world, Norman. The history of the world it seems to me since civilization has been a one where you had a relatively few at a leadership position and they were able to, uh, if they wish or were able to, they were able to conquer or co-opt peoples and set up a system where the few ruled and the many were ruled. Yeah. And it seems to have held in, in, in Egypt, uh, it seemed to hold in Rome, it seemed to hold the dynastic states for a thousand years after Rome. Yeah. And there's always a few people who ran everything, and most of the vasses of the people of the world were at best serfs on a feudal estate where Absolutely. all the assets and productive capability was held by a relatively small group. Absolutely. That continued in the United States of America despite yes. all the, the you know, declaration of independence. You had, a, you had a concentration of ownership and power in the hands of a few, and that has continued right up to the present. Is that not correct? Yeah, that, that is correct, for, uh, Harold. But, but one thing you'll find hmm. in the uh, in the founders uh, were uh, an understanding of property yeah. that most people do not understand. It's not taught to you know, very well in academia. As uh -huh. a matter of fact, the first day of the property course, they tell you mm. that property are not the things that you own. Uh huh. It's your rights and powers with respect to things. Well, they did try and, to grant them. In other words, yeah. slavery. Yeah. It's when you turn people into things. Yeah. And, and you okay. own people. Yeah. And you, and you have yeah. control over people. And you have the fruits don't belong to the people who create. <laughs> right. Who create right. the wealth. Right. But rather, it belongs to whoever owns your body. And that. And and so America was born with an original sin. Mm. The uh, slavery. Slavery. Slavery was there, and there were a whole lots of history. Is a night I I got in touch with Lewis Kelso, as you know, through my contact with uh, Marshall McLuhan, who was a comprehensivist uh, media analysis, and he had written in a book. Uh, uh, he had had a ball reading. I think it was uh, uh, how to turn 60 million Americans uh, in two, uh, into capitalists on borrowed money. He had a ball reading it. And that's what got me in touch with you. 64. Yeah. Uh, but that was not with Kelso and Adler. So I want to stick. No, with that Kelso wasn't with Adler. Kelso and Adler. Yeah. That, yeah. Okay, I want to stick with Kelso and Adler. I think the book, okay. which was the, the title, uh, you're right, the original title was How to Turn 80 Million 
uh, uh, 80 million uh, workers, workers into capitalism. Capitalist on borrowed money. That's a great and, title. And, and, then they, <laughs> and then they changed the title. Yeah, right. Two factor theory, the economics of reality. Yeah. And and this is after I met Kel, so you'll, you'll notice that he, he mentions. He mentions me. You had I, a hand in changing that then, right? I, I had a... Well, You've had a big hand in letting people know about Mr. Kelso. I, I, we want to get to that. But I, one, could I bring up one thing, Norman? You talked about that second book about how to, to save, uh, to can have it uh, escape from savings as a I, basis by which we're going to form I, capital. That's but, a very important issue. You want to get to where the people or the capital formation is tied into the future earnings as a way that does inform the yeah. business community. Carol, and it, that has something that has to be done on a large scale if we get I, out of the mess we're in now. Yeah. Let, let me say this. Yeah. I look at, I look at, at uh, uh, your focus and Buc Bucky's focus brilliantly on the physical changes that are taking place, on the changes in the energy slaves mm -hmm. that are taking place, the robotry that replaces hundreds if not thousands of human beings um, at all levels. Now, yeah. many, many things that were done by human beings, mm. uh, the owners of capital simply displaced them in yeah. order to generate more profits. Bringing up Fuller is another person that you and I both agree was a major comprehensive thinker that would be good to be linked to uh, Kelso, it seems to me. He's linked to a great number of people that don't necessarily link to Ka Kelso, but they ought to. Yeah, I had okay. two 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 connections with with Bucky. Uh, one was when I was working in Harlem, but that leaves out. There's how, Ennis Francis, right? Out of the story that and, brings and up. I Ennis. think it's important uh -huh. to see the uh, see each of the steps yeah. that led to to the just third way. Yeah. And, and whatever we did. Yeah. And rather than uh, I will get into savings and credit and money and how that's created and how it could be created uh, right. with Kelso's ideas. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, but, right. But I think I think you want to look at this in terms of the movement. We yeah. need a movement of people. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you've got to see where the movement, the civil rights movement, went off base and as I went off base with them. Uh -huh. uh, and then how uh, it, it then we can see what has to be done. For example, uh, when I changed to the poverty program, I cer certainly saw a way in which you can subsidize the organization of grassroots organizations right. that would get behind the negative income tax or yeah. the guaranteed annual income. Right. See, that was my motivation for at the, the, time. the poverty program. That was, at the time was progressive. That, well, it was yeah. it, oh, it's it's seen as such. Yeah. What you mean by progressive? But anyway, yeah. it was wrong. Yeah. It, it, because it, what it, what it turned out that despite the idea, the basic one of the biggest ideas that attracted me mm. to the poor on poverty was the notion of maximum feasible participation of the poor. That I saw work in Mississippi. I thought this could work everywhere if we organize the poor with a plan with a set of objectives yeah that would have been the wrong set of objectives uh -huh. lots and welfare because yeah. because we had no better idea and then i uh, uh, and i was working in in san francisco putting together poverty programs through our of, of financing funding yeah. poverty programs uh throughout the west coast california arizona nevada and so on and then I saw it became clear to me that I was, res I there was resistance coming from within the war on poverty from the bureaucrats. Uh -huh. Did not they wanted to get the money to the leaders? I wanted to get the money to grassroots <laughs> organizations. Right, so right. I myself in an, an intolerable situation, and, and I was going to quit. And I uh -huh. did, finally did quit very soon after that. Uh -huh. But somebody walked into my office, the man, Mark Goldies, who's still in California, mm. who's one of the leaders of the free uh, a free university movement in California. Uh -huh. And I never heard of my, uh, Mark. He just came into my office. Somebody su suggested that he talk to me. Uh, and we talked, and, and he introduced me 
the Lewis Kelso's ideas. Oh, really? It, that's it, where you first heard of it. That's right. Okay. It didn't take me uh -huh. more than five or ten minutes listening to his introduction to it, and I suddenly said to myself, why didn't I think of it? This do you have simple? Do, do you have that, that like Mr. Nixon was keeping tapes in his Oval Office? Were you keeping tapes? Do you have that on tape so it could be repeated to others who could pick up the basic principle in five minutes the way you did? Yeah, that's a hold on to that. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's see that's important because otherwise I would have missed the whole point. I suddenly <laughs> thought how the revolution could take place. Yeah, so I had done a critique before I. Uh, in 1957, before the Capitalist Manifesto was mm. published, he wrote something called Karl Marx, The Almost Capitalist. Uh, right, right, it's right. A magnet, and that, too, appears on our website. When was that written? When was, when was that article written? Uh, it was 57, the American Bar That was 57? Yes, 19. He wrote that, Cap the Karl Marx, The Almost Capitalist, in 1957? Correct. Wow. Okay. I didn't realize it was that early. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it's a superb piece. You can get it free from our website at cesj.org. Yeah, that's cesj, everybody. Dot org. Yeah. Now, now, what 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 turned me on was this. I knew the definition of property from the first day of the property course in law school. Yeah. But it's never repeated after that, after you're taking property courses. And, and but that one, what I learned, it, it was that it's not the thing, it's the powers and rights and privileges you have with respect to things, not people, but things. Okay. And, and, and that, of course, under slavery, people were created, were made into were things. Were things, yeah, right. That's right. The, the, the and in practical part. terms, a lot of people were seen as things by those who owned the uh, means to order them about and so forth throughout exactly. all of history, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so, so that was all I had to hear, that capital could be financed in ways that it was became a universal human right that was in practical terms you could build ownership into every citizen of the world okay why had it not happened over the history of civilization if that is the history because that's a good question harold now i'll tell you my answer huh. academia Academia, <laughs> justice, yeah. it's not the economic justice, because the first time I ever heard of economic justice in any terms other than the, 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 the problems, the economic problems, yeah. the economic injustices, mm -hmm, yeah. I didn't understand, and I am very, the causes, thinking, yeah. without reading Kelso's chapter five, well, it's a, probably more Adler than Kelso. You the, think I, I thought Adler had a rel relatively small, almost just implementor role no, in that. Look, that first book would not have been published without Adler, Adler agreeing yeah. to, uh, to, to, to be a co author. Adler's yeah. preface to that book is Says, magnificent. Yeah. Well, Adler was a hell of a philosopher and writer, a major figure. <laughs> he, was, yeah. he was a very good thinker. Uh -huh. He used to teach the philosophy of law. Mm -hmm. and, at the University of Chicago yeah. Law School, uh -huh. where I got there. Right. Uh, and but anyway, when I read Chapter Five of the Capitalist Manifesto, they laid out the three principles. Uh huh. What are they? Can you summarize them, or what? Oh sure. Yeah. One is an input principle. Mm -hmm. How to produce wealth. You know, economics is production and consumption. You produce wealth for consumers. Yeah. The consumers have to produce, or somebody else has to produce whatever they're going to consume. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the first is or an something input else, principle. including capital instruments. Uh, or, or the instrumentations that are controlled me, by capital let me, interest. Let me, let me okay. talk uh, yeah. I, I, I will get, go a little bit deeper, but let me okay. talk about who got the three principles. Sorry, are. sorry. Go let ahead. Explain yeah. Explain that. Yeah. Uh, so one is an input principle. Uh -huh. Every system you have to make inputs. Mm -hmm. The other is an output principle. Yeah. And they called it the principle of participation. Uh, I call it distributive justice. Okay. Okay. Right, yeah. and, and the third is, as in every, every system, there's a feedback 
principle that determines when you go wrong so you can correct the input or output principle. Very important to scientific or evolutionary process so for that matter. Let's yeah. take one at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the first is, uh, is uh, uh, participative input. justice. And participative justice is simple. It says there are only two ways that wealth can be produced. Mm. There are two basic factors. Everything falls into one of the two. Uh -huh. One are people, yeah. and that can be called labor. Yeah, okay. Human inputs, you can, you can contribute to wealth. Mm -hmm. The second is uh, the productive capacity of the tools, the, what Bucky's talking about, no. the, 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 the natural resources, the, the technology, the robots, the rentable space, the infrastructure. That's what makes the modern world different from the world of the past. Let me ask you a little sidebar. Was that what uh, 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 the uh, Georgists are talking about when they talk about uh, land? Or where, where does George fit in, if I may? I don't want to throw I'll a monkey wrench George. in. Uh, what, what, it, 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 to Henry George, the, uh, a land would be owned by government. So that so that he wanted to abolish all kinds of taxes mm -hmm. by having the government own land and and then charge everybody rents on the land and the rents would be uh, the tax system. It's, okay, I, I didn't mean to throw a monkey wrench in, but George is somebody to be aware of. But go ahead, go on, spell it out. Spell it out. <laughs> but, but George was wrong. He was okay on on uh, ownership of tools uh -huh. of the of the of the human created uh, uh, things that go into production. but So he was okay on a free market, free enterprise system for that, but he was not on land. Mm -hmm. And as far as we're concerned, uh, the United States, all the land and natural resources should be owned, as, as you probably know, through what we call a citizen's land bank. Uh -huh. So every American citizen would have an equal share in the land and that any rents from the land. Uh huh. Yeah, and that, that would have government would not flow to government, but flow to the owners. And so that would that that the poor uh -huh. and and Bill Gates would get the same uh, the same uh, rent income from ownership of the natural yeah. resources. That know. that dual view where you're saying it it, it is the uh, you tools and technology, and that can be seen in a certain sense back to Fuller maybe or back to others. Of course, in, of course because Fuller. Fuller uh, was a master of the physical uh, yeah. uh, inputs uh -huh. and how you uh, take from the natural resources and do more and more with less and less, uh, what he called ephemeralization. Yeah, that's particularly he, operative now, I think. There's yeah. no, but there's no limit to, yeah, right. to, to human uh, capacity to what uh, Fuller, what I called, what he called himself, a world designed science. Yeah. Uh, uh, the world design scientists. They call them anticipatory design yeah. science, yeah. looking That's at right. the future. But the thing is, evolutionarily, it was pretty unique, the ability not only to have a self-reflective consciousness that seems to be characteristic uniquely of Homo sapien, but we, also the ability to extend consciousness through exactly. tools and technology, which is pretty unique to the Homo sapien species. It's different. Yeah. In yeah, finding uh, a cave when you're embedded in nature and being able to make a house with the furnace and stuff. As, you know. as, I, as I was saying to you, I recognize Bucky's brilliance. Yeah. And, I, and we were going to work with Kelso in Harlem to build a new city after the riots there in That's, 68. Yeah, right. Okay, so, and then later, Bucky had designed a new city in East St. Louis, and I was working. Edwardsville. I taught at Edwardsville for a year, where they were going to build that Old Man River That's project. Right. And, yeah. and you, you should be in touch with Bill Perk, who was. Yeah, I know. I want to. He's that. He's down at Carbondale, isn't exactly. he? Well, he, he retired, but yeah. I guess he's in Carbondale, yeah. and he worked. He was a colleague of Bucky. Yeah, that was where Bucky did a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. A lot of the design decades, 65 to 75 was developed there, the world game thing, yeah. Uh, and also, you see, Bucky worked with this friend of mine, who, who later became a friend in the 90s, uh, to build a new city in, in East St. Louis that he called Old Man River City. Yeah, right, right, right. Okay, there was a dancer involved. That. There was a major... 
Bucky, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this kind of gets away from Kelso. Yeah, but yeah let's get Bucky, back to Kelso. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah but, but let, we can say one thing about Bucky. It, 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 Bucky was brilliant Absolutely. in terms of what you could see, mm -hmm. the visible things, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. But Bucky, in my view, needed Kelso in talking about the invisible tools. Uh -huh. Bucky, you yeah. see? Yeah, contracts. yeah, right, right. Uh, it, this, these are things that Bucky did not perceive as well. As you know, the history of Bucky, yeah. he started, he was, he couldn't Blind. see <laughs> for, for some years. And when he suddenly could see the physical world, uh, he became a guy who that was his basic uh, uh, strength right. and, and brought that to the world. But, no. but Kelso brought something and I wanted to combine yeah. Oh, so did yeah. I. My whole life is dedicated to trying to get those two together, if we can, to make a big change in the world. I think they're two leading lights, yeah. So what happened I, when I got into Harlem in 68, uh, working with Ennis Francis and yeah. the Central Harlem Council and Neighborhood Boards, yeah. uh, I contacted Kelso and brought him in the, to uh, to Harlem. He gave a few lectures. It was terrific. And then I got in touch with Bucky, and Bucky sends me an article that he had published in Esquire magazine, a whole plan <laughs> of Harlem. He had his own plan. Right. He had already worked it out <laughs> anticipatorily. Yeah, right. Yeah. He was ahead of the curve. Yeah, right. But well, you were it, back, and the first person you said was out in the East Co West Coast who introduced you to was the person of Louis Kelso. And when did you first meet him? As and I said, it was 65, March of 65. Where did you meet with him? In San Francisco? San Francisco, uh -huh. the, in the, in the uh, uh, poverty uh, program offices, that is the federal uh, offices in San Francisco. How did he happen to be in that office the day oh, you met him? Had you set uh, it up ahead of time? Was it a chance guy, meeting guy, at a uh, saloon uh, or what? John Martinson, mm. uh, who I knew in Washington, knew Mark Goldies, and told Mark, why don't you go ahead and, and, and contact uh, Norm? And he did. Yeah. And, and I'm still in touch with Mark Goldies. He's, yeah. he's into alternate energy systems. Okay. He, so he's still a, 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 you know, a friend. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, and, and you should have him on your on your program. Boy, well, I'm going to try and get a whole lot of people on. But go ahead, yeah. Okay, so th so so I when I heard of the Kelso idea, uh -huh. I immediately said I have to leave. Uh -huh. I can't stand the federal government. Yeah. They're not solving the problem. Mm -hmm. and went to work in a uh, uh, in a new organization. Uh, hired by the same guy who hired me in the poverty program, uh, Dick Boone, and his obituary just appeared in today's Washington Post. I'm sorry. And Dick was a, a close friend of Bob Kennedy. Dick was the spirit behind maximum feasible participation of the poor. Very interesting guy. Yeah. He he headed up the the, the the Robert F Kennedy Foundation, the Field Foundation. He came out of he he also came out of the University of Chicago. Uh, anyway, a very interesting guy. Yeah. He hired me, and knowing that I was pushing the Kelso idea. Ah. Uh -huh. Okay. And, and so it took a lot of guts on his part mm -hmm. to hire me because automatically that gave me entree to be able to talk to grassroots groups all over the country. Right. And you're coming with an idea of a guy who's written the Capitalist Manifesto in that environment. And, and that's not exactly that's not exactly what they want to hear on the exactly. on the title page. And, and, <laughs> and, and this group was headed by Walter Ruther. Yeah. I did all the workers that had all the progressive uh labor. Yeah. All the civil rights leaders, right? And Michael Harrington, Michael Blair, Harrington, Michael. other America, yeah. yeah. And anyway, I arranged, uh, and of course, I I was pushing to get grassroots people. They had grassroots leaders coming in, and they had a convention, the first of their annual conventions, and I arranged for Kelso to come in. Good. And Kelso gave a little presentation. And the the, uh, the liberals all were opposed. I mean, yeah. as a matter of fact, when you <clears throat> said, "Why don't you study this?" Mm. <laughs> yeah. And see that 
uh, instead of uh, the normal procedure, all the people on the podium, all the liberals, uh, all raised their hands in opposition. And yeah. then they asked, well, who's in favor of this? It turns out that the, the grassroots loved it. Oh, really? That's interesting. That's, That's an interesting yeah. thing. That's an and, interesting... and so the next day there was a riot uh, uh, there uh, because uh, uh, the head of the poverty program, Sergeant Shriver, gave yeah. speeches as, as if he was giving a speech to the Chamber of Commerce. Mm. The grassroots people got very angry because they knew that the war on poverty was a phony in many respects. Yeah. And they started, they were they were uh, just yelling at him mm. and they had to escort him out of the, out of the uh, 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 convention. Well, I think a movie ought to be made of your life if you could do it, because I think it would be an Academy Award winning thing. Who would play you? I guess it would have to be you, I guess. Well, well, you you know, get I, it, 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 I feel very fortunate that whatever it was, I, I had a family who liked what I was doing. Uh, I, it was my life. It's the most important thing in my life. Your it's, life was the it, most it, important thing in your life. Can I quote you on that? Absolutely. Okay. My well, wife knows that. Oh, your did you say your <laughs> life was the most important thing in your life or I your wife? That, I said I said the work of justice. No, you said your <laughs> life or did you say your wife was the most important thing? I said thing? my wife supported it. Marie supported it. But the, did you say Norman we're friends? Was it your wife was the most important thing in your life or your life was the most important no, thing? My in work you? was the most important. No, you said, uh, we'll go, it's on the tape, just, Norman. Just, just the we'll look it up. I want to know, was Maria the major thing in your life, or was it your life's work yourself that was? Life I, work. I'm playing with you, Norman, but we're on the tape now. It's on tape, Norman, so you got to be careful about what you say. I hope it was your wife was the most important thing in your life. Well, my wife was working with me. Okay, okay, you're off the hook. You're if off the she hook. Didn't, if she didn't like this, she... It would have been difficult. It would have been. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm playing with you. Know, she got married a revolutionary. Yeah. And and she was happy about that. Okay. If, as you know, yeah. it was in the internment camps during... I'm the, hip, I know. Yeah, I had a nice talk with her on the telephone the other day. Give her my love, right? And everything like that. Now, Norman, we've been talking about 46 minutes, okay, of 58. And we've been talking a good deal about the background to you and to your... Maybe we can get back to some of the principles uh, uh, about Lewis. What sets him apart? Okay. I'm surprised that there is much done. I'm surprised in the recent few months and everything that there is an awful lot is done that has picked up upon his idea and uh, more than I had realized and that that idea, it appears to me is the most important idea that could be put out in the world society in order to help avert uh, major calamities that could be in front of us by our sticking to old paradigms and old patterns of thought and institutions. And it ought to be much more widely understood by the intellectual community and the political community. Not and maybe we that. ought to get to spelling some of what those major transformations are being heralded by Mr. Kelso and maybe with a little background uh, from Mr. K uh, Fuller. But maybe yeah, we should get to that. Uh, it, you know, to make it, put it on pra in practical terms, yeah. Monday, uh, uh, Dawn, my daughter, yeah. working with me for many, many years. Yeah, give her my best, yeah. Okay. Uh, she's arranged for me to speak with uh, uh, some of the teachers or professors at the War College. Oh, War College, okay. yeah. Okay. Because, because you see, uh, Sun Tzu said, you, you know, the that you, in order to avoid war, you mm. have to have overwhelming strength. Mm. But, but as you know, uh, Dumas said that more important, more powerful than all the armies in the world is an, an idea, idea whose time, whose has, time come. has come. Yes, it's that true. is what that is what I say to you. Mm -hmm. My work is more important than me. And now I'm finding that students finally, mm. it's, uh, no longer people of my age yeah. and, and middle age. No, I got students now. Uh, we have an intern here from American U who's mm. so fired up, and mm. she's reaching out to other leaders. She's a leader, and I see the leaders 
taking over our ideas. I'm ready to just hand them the ideas, help them understand it, mm. and let them lead. And she's going to be, uh, she and some of the other student leaders are going to be with us at the Federal Reserve. But so what are some of the grounding principles that we ought to have uh, the audience suggest they consider that makes Lewis Kelso's vision, if that's the right term, right. relevant to the questions that confront humanity in this year, 2014. Okay, let, let's let's talk about the basic ideas. We 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 we, we never finished what I think are the most important and those three oh, principles. Oh, do by means, do it, do it, do it, do it. Okay. Yeah, finish that. Finish so that one now. is that you can produce either through your either through your labor or through your ownership, and yeah. as technology displaces human beings free them up so they have leisure time for example if professors had enough uh, uh, assets and, and receive asset incomes they could teach for free instead of uh, doing what what is really, really good turning uh, their their income levels uh, have resulted in in students uh, now getting so fed up with academia because uh, they, they're they told that a good education is necessary in order to earn a living. Yeah, you know? it's all, that's all it is. It's a job training situation. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Or it's credentialing and, for and you to make so money. Yeah. Taught that mm. leisure work is ultimately important. To free yourself up from doing work that a machine can do. Right. The only way you can do that, the way, if the machine wants your job, own the machine, mm. own the robot, mm. get the fruits of ownership, and that's the uh, the principle of participation. You can only participate in production effectively, uh, and I'm talking about every child, woman, and man in the world yeah. to become owners. Oh, of you put it out in a world context. That's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and so rather than just national. This, so then, then you look at output. And that's distributive justice. Now, many people use that term to mean charity. Yeah. You distribute according to charity. And mm. also an elder said, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. That charity is important. It's the sort of what some people call the soul of justice. Uh -huh. It should never be a substitute for justice. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. gotta, so how do you distribute? Well, you distribute according to the market value of your labor. Uh -huh. You don't just use the government to, to give you a, a, a raise the, the minimum wage. That's, that's nonsense. All that does is, is, is increase costs. It's going to make it more difficult. All it's, right. just, uh, it's going to eliminate, it's going to eliminate markets if you're, if, you're, if you're producing for the world, if you're producing whatever it is that we're producing. And that's the same thing worldwide. The market is the most objective and democratic way to determine values. Do you think do you think that that way of thinking is informed by what has been called the labor theory of value? Exactly. The, the and labor the labor theory of value informs a good deal of the rationales by which our political positions are taken. It yeah. ought to be examined You're as right. a basic yeah. premise, right? You're right. Okay. It, it, but see, the left is the informed by the is the labor theory of value. Mm -hmm. The labor theory of value says that you know, they use the term productivity. That means output per worker. Per yeah, right. See, but the output is coming from the input. Really, it isn't that human beings are working harder and smarter than they did before. No, it's the machines. No, but they and wanted to put how like can you. How can this is Kelso's theory is how can you distribute uh, to labor what's being produced? By capital. Well, there was a time when labor was much more significant and important and crucial. Remember, they used to have uh, in the 50, uh, they, they, the labor union movement. My, my, uh, a rep, um, well, never mind. It's personal, but the labor movement had a real clout at one time, but, but, and they but, never did bargain for anything other than more wages. Uh, they but, never bargained for ownership of the capital instruments that were representing the productive capability of non-human put input to production as they could have yes. if they had seen the wisdom of Lewis, it seems to me. When, uh, Harold, I want to say something about that. Okay. Uh, Walter Ruther was one of the smartest guys in the labor movement. Yeah. He's really a thinker. Yeah. And, and he testified in 67 now. He died in an airplane crash a couple of years later. Mm-hmm. But he said, 
if you would democratize the ownership of, uh, of the corporations so that all the workers could become owners, and they would get their increases in ways that wouldn't increase cost. Yeah. So okay. he, he pointed out, and this is before the Joint Economic Committee, yeah. he says, because labor and other material costs are all going to prices. Uh -huh. but what is over from the revenues that come in from selling whatever goods or services, mm -hmm. uh, you, you, that goes into prices. But profits are what's left over uh -huh. if profit if if uh the, uh, the capital capital tools mm -hmm. what's producing the wealth uh, uh, he recognized that if the workers could own and receive profits getting their increase from the bottom line mm -hmm. it would not go into cost uh -huh. so basic and yeah. simple uh -huh. to understand that that this is the reason that the labor movements uh, once had over 35 percent of the workforce yeah right uh. and now it's left, the, the private sector workforce is less than seven percent yeah in the private sector public sector there but so, yeah so, but, but, see, but okay. Kelso, I think Kelso influenced Walter Ruther. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah, so okay. He was offering an answer. Uh -huh. And otherwise, what we're proposing is that the labor unions have to stretch their minds over what I'll call wage slavery. Yeah, well, wage slavery has been operative. For, yeah. And the welfare slaves and the charity slaves and the consumer debt uh, slaves. That's all people can get. They can't get capital credit. They oh. can get consumer credit. Well, and that, that's killing them. That's what's killing the students. And they are, who, yeah, who, they, who, who, are, who are given money uh, on loans, and they and they find that they, they're not going to get the job. They come, they come out of the university with a huge debt burden, and then you got a whole national debt burden that is there and used and so forth. So that is a. So, so that is a reality. Second principle now: how you should distribute according to the market. Mm. And, but first, you have to be an owner. Mm. So, so you have to participate as an owner. Well, the third, the third principle is: if there's a violation of participative justice or participation or distribution, then the next thing, what Kelso they called it the anti-monopoly, anti-greed principle, the principle of limitation. They said, no, I I, I don't think that's good enough. The, the best is uh, is social justice. Okay, I now listen. Norman, in this universe, I don't know about parallel universes, we do have a certain tier, particularly in television, we have a tyranny of, uh, well, time, and we're running out of time for this particular program. This is part one of Good. two programs, and we've laid that out, but it seems to me we've got a number of things that we can take up to, uh, to sort of close quotes on this, uh, this, part this part of the program. And I want, it's so good to be in touch with you and those principles. Why don't we uh, take a little break and uh, we'll, we'll close this program out now. And uh, you, we've been talking with Norman Curlin by a Skype interview down in Washington. Happy to have had you view the program. And we invite you to possibly uh, take note of the fact that this is going to be followed tomorrow's broadcasting with the second hour with Norman Curlin, the president of the Center for Economic and Social Justice, CESJ.org, and the managing director of Equity Expansion International, Inc. Thank you for viewing. We'll be uh, coming back uh, with part two tomorrow. That's the end of this part one. Thank you for viewing. And we will be back uh, tomorrow. Thanks a lot very much. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. Okay. Okay, I got to unmic myself, and it'll be, I don't know. Yeah, uh, one of the things is, you, you know, yeah. the, the, okay. the problem. Yeah. The, the Drew says, we're down, and so, uh, Drew, yeah, yeah. listen, to Norman's talking. What, Norman? I, I was saying, we haven't yet uh, talked about how 
I went to work with Kel Selman, okay, Kel okay, okay, we'll do that. What I learned, I think another yeah, sub the subject is now to get into money and tax okay, capital we'll, homestead. We'll, we'll talk about it. I got to take care of Drew now. We have to get together on the tape. We have to do some technical stuff here, Norm. Okay. okay so we'll be back in touch. Right.